Welcome tonight to the Lessons of Vietnam. My name is Bill Dixon. I uh, appreciate you tuning in tonight. Uh, I'm here and with the uh, International Headquarters uh, Production Facilities of Amnon Nissan, uh, Nissan Communications. He's a director, producer, dishwasher, and whatever else that uh, I need to have done while I'm here. Uh, tonight's show uh, may, be, may shock some of you. Uh, don't call in and tell me that you are offended by the word moron. I did not use the word. I'm just using it because it was used in the context of tonight's show. And the show is not necessarily anti-McNamara, other than the fact that I want to talk about uh, one of his many programs that uh, failed uh, during the Vietnam War. But to get started, I want to uh, invite you to tune in on your computer. Uh, go to Computers 2K Now, that 2K, K is in Kilo, uh, uh, Voice, excuse me, Computers 2K Voice. I got corrected before I got corrected. Uh, computers 2K Voice, uh, and type in your uh, questions or whatever, or give us a call at 919-518-9773. Now, to get started into our show tonight, I want to give you some background. We'll go all the way back to uh, President Kennedy. And uh, President Kennedy uh, had this thing going with the Pentagon. So he uh, come up with his whiz kids, uh, these people who would Harvard uh, graduates, who were smarter than anybody else in the world, who love all kinds of gimmicks and so forth. So he brought in his whiz kids uh, to kind of counteractive the uh, Pentagon uh, and the chief of staff there so that uh, uh, they could get some of the power away from them. And from the start of the president, Kennedy feared that the Pentagon brass would overact to Soviet provocations and drive the country into a disastrous nuclear conflict. He was really concerned that he didn't have the control over the nuclear uh, trigger that the uh, Pentagon had it. And uh, uh, it's kind of funny that the Soviets were probably uh, didn't distrust the Pentagon as much as, as as much as Kennedy did. So he brought in the brightest and the best. Uh, that's also the name of a book by David Haberstein, and it's uh, the uh, about the Vietnam War and uh, and and the people that um, uh, Kennedy brought in. The focus of the book is on the erroneous foreign policy crafted by the academics and intellectuals who were in John F. Kennedy's administration, and the disastrous consequences of those policies in Vietnam. The title refers to Kennedy's whiz kids, leaders of industry and academia, brought into to the Kennedy administration, whom Haverstein characterized as arrogantly insisting on brilliant policies that defied common sense. In Vietnam, often the, uh, against the advice of career U.S. Department of State employees. It's always good to be surrounded by smart people, but at the same time, you uh, need to get a little bit of information from everybody. And the Pentagon, as, as Kennedy was coming into power, uh, he was the young, youngest uh, man ever elected president. And that concerned the Pentagon, but at the same time, he was just a lieutenant in the Navy. And even on that, his PT boat got shot that shot and sunk, so they didn't look at him as uh, uh, really, really a strong leader there at all. So they were uh, upset when he came in and tried to take power. With Kennedy was no power, was a power struggle from the day of inauguration of who controlled the nuclear arsenal, as I mentioned, who had the key. NATO Commander General Lewis Nordstrom and two Air Force Generals, Curtis LeMay and, and Thomas Power, stubbornly opposed White House directives that reduced their authority, their authority to decide where to go, when to go nuclear. The 50-year-old Nordstrand confirmed his reputation as fiercely independent when two high-profile Kennedy emissaries, thought to be Secretary of State Dean Rusk and Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara, visited NATO Strategic Military and Command in Belgium, and they asked whether Nordstrand's primary obligation was to the United States or to its uh, European allies. Um, that didn't go over very well, as you can probably imagine. So even, even then they were trying to do it. And later on during the uh, Cuban Middle Crisis, a, a missile crisis, which I go into before, it's a good thing, I guess, that uh, he had wrestled the control over the nuclear arms uh, with the Pentagon and so forth. Now, 
meeting with his uh, national security advisors three weeks before the assault on Cuba's Bay of Pigs. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, when Castro took over, uh, who we helped, uh, take over Cuba, uh, and we discovered he was all of a sudden became communist, uh -huh, that the uh, Cuban-Americans who were exiles uh, came in, and they were going to go back and take Cuba back. And the uh, United States government supposedly in the background was helping them and training them and so forth, and they had their own base. So the Bay of Pigs was the, uh, was the attack by the uh, Cuban, Cuban exiles that were going to take over. The only problem was that uh, in their plans, the uh, American government was also supposed to go in and help them out, which is, uh, didn't quite happen. Kennedy did not want America to be involved in public. So... Uh, he had them, rather than land where they were supposed to land, he had them come in a different landing place. So then they had to go 30 miles through the swamps to get to where they were supposed to go. And, well, uh, as I says here, Kennedy insisted that leaders of the Cuban exiles be told that U.S. strike force would not be allowed to participate in or support the invasion of any way. Because he was, Kennedy was told by the uh, Pentagon that there was good chance that we, they could still win by going in. The operation was a miserable uh, failure. Uh, more than 100 invaders killed and some 1,200 captured of about 1,400, uh, which didn't leave a whole lot. Despite his determination to bar the military from taking a direct role in the invasion, Kennedy uh, did reluctantly send in a last minute appeal uh, to air support and uh, the four Alabama National Guard pilots who were engaged in that combat uh, and were killed. Nobody ever heard about him for a long, long time until it's been uh, that uh, secret uh, information there has been uh, uh, released. So the CI history of the Bay of Pigs fiasco uh, was one way to look at it. It was later discovered by the Bay of, Bay of Pigs histo history includes CI meeting notes, which Kennedy never saw, predicting a failure unless the United States intervened directly. Now, afterwards, when Kennedy found out, he, uh, excused, he accused himself of naivety for trusting the military's judgment that the Cuban operation was well thought out and capable of success, as he was told. And to quote him, uh, President John F. Kennedy, those son of a bitches with all the fruit sided just sat there nodding, said it could work, said, Kennedy said of the chiefs. He repeated, told his wife, oh, my God, that bunch of advisors that we inherited. Kennedy concluded that he was too little schooled in the Pentagon's covert ways and he had only differential to, and uh, had been overly differential to the CIA and to the military chiefs, which was what brought about the bringing in of his whiz kids. Later, uh, okay, yeah. Kennedy told Schlesinger, uh, part of his staff, he had made the mistake of thinking that the military and intelligence people had some secret skill not available to ordinary mortals, like there was something special. And he says his, listen, his lessons were he never rely on the experts, or at least be skeptical of the insider's expert advice and consult with outsiders who may hold a more detached view of the policy in question. And we, we would all end up eating those words eventually. If you, some of you may not remember, but the original Special Forces were part of the CIA. Uh, a good friend of mine was with the Special Forces when they were CIA. In fact, he is one of the men that recruited the Montagnards to fight for us uh, originally. He took it away from uh, he took the Special away, away from the CIA and turned it over to the military, and then he kind of turned the uh, military over to his whiz kids, so he'd have control. Setting the whole, all this, all the things we're going to be talking about uh, later in motion. It's just like why do we, why do we have the problem with Vietnam? Because after World War II, they gave Vietnam back to the uh, French. The French went back in, and the Viet Minh uh, continued fighting. 
Uh, we furnished uh, the money and, and, and a lot of support for the battle at Den Ben Phu, which was a disaster for the French and pulled out. So that's how we ended up getting uh, into Vietnam and the communism to start with. With President Kennedy's total disdain for the attitude and power of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he brought in his whiz kids to advise him and take as much power and control from the military establishment as he possible. And Robert McNamara was his top advisor, uh, the, number, the number one whiz kid. Now, who is this Robert McNamara fellow? Well, he was formerly the president of uh, Ford Motor Company, and I used to say bad things about him because uh, I knew that he was at Ford Motor Company along about the time that Edsel uh, was there. And uh, Edsel, to me, I always said it looked like it was a uh, uh, car sucking a lemon because the, the grill went up and down. Uh, there was another name for it, and it was um, basically the Ford Vagina way that looked. That's what some of the people at Ford Motor Company call it. Uh, but they were brought, he was brought in to get Ford back on its feet. He was the first man outside the Ford family to come in. He was only with Ford for about a, about a month, I think, when um, John F. Kennedy called him in. He served as uh, defense under two presidents, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Baines Johnson from 1961 until 1968. He initially supported U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War and encouraged President Johnson to escalate in 1964, but he later began privately to question United States policy and eventually advocated a negotiated settlement to the war. In the summer of 1967, he helped draft the San Antonio Formula, a peace proposal often to the end of the United States bombing of the North and asking North Vietnam to join in productive discussions. That North Vietnamese, uh, that the North Vietnamese rejected that proposal in October. Going along those same lines, he was also uh, highly encouraged Kennedy to send more special forces men into Vietnam uh, before other events. Now, before that, let's talk about who the man was in his history and so forth. Uh, his name was, and I, I think the name fits him very well, Robert Strange McNamara was born on June 9, 1916 in San Francisco, California. McNamara is best known as the Secretary of Defense in the 1960s and an important figure in the controversial Vietnam War. In 1937, he graduated a degree in economics from the University of California at Berkeley, which explains a lot. An excellent student, McNamara went on to study at Harvard Harvard Business School when he earned his master's degree in 1939. In 1943, McNamara entered the United States Army Corps, but because of his bad vision, uh, they, they kept him out of war. But his sharp and analytical, I, I can say that my tongue can say that word, analytical skills and talent for statistics to work on military situations while he was in the Army. Not long after the war, he and, and, nine, he and nine other members from the uh, Army Statistical Control Group went to work with Henry Ford at, at Ford Motor Company, as I said. Now, President John F. Kennedy tapped him to become his Secretary of Defense, looking him to, to reorganize the country's defense program. McNamara officially took the po over the post in January of 1961. As Secretary of Defense, McNamara faced many challenges, in, including the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, which I remember very well. I was in high school at the time getting out of high school, and the Russians were putting uh, missiles into Cuba, and we said that wasn't going to happen because Cuba being 90 miles off the American coast, it was not a good place to have missiles. We already had problems with uh, Castro in Cuba. So Kennedy gave an ultimatum to Nikita Khrushchev, who said get the missiles out of Cuba by such and such a time, or we will strike. And the whole world, for a while there, just kind of sit back going, okay, what's going to happen? It's Khrushchev who was supposed to be this strong, take your shoes off and beat it on the uh, podium, uh, dictator of, uh, of Russia, or this brand new young president. Which one was going to, which one was going to hold out? Well, thank goodness for all of us. Uh, Khrushchev relented, and they removed the... Um, missiles from Cuba, 
so we're able to uh, breathe a little bit while, a little bit longer. And as I mentioned, he, uh, uh, McNamara uh, was involved in that. Uh, and he, as I said, he also uh, agreed to send, we need to send more advisors into Vietnam. Now, then I keep skipping. One. I keep I keep turning two pages, and and Amnon keeps me straight turning one page. Uh, one lesson the Bay of Pigs McNamara told the Joint Chiefs of Staff was that the government should never start anything unless it could be finished, or the government was willing to face the consequences of failure according to the State Department's official record of America's foreign policy. Now, I think that's very ironic when you look at the outcome of the Vietnam War. Uh, let me read that to you again. McNamara says, the government should never start anything unless it could be finished or the government was willing to face the consequences of failure. Um, I'll let you think about that one for a little while with, uh, with Vietnam and uh, Iraq, Iraq, Afghanistan, Korea, and uh, and so forth. So. Now, even back as early as 1964, Senator Wayne Morris, a Democrat from Oregon, called Vietnam McNamara's War. And McNamara always said, "I'm pleased to be identified with it." He said, "And I and do whatever I can do to win it," because he ran the entire war. Everything, just about every every policy we had, uh, came up through him and his whiz kids. He basically told the Pentagon what to do. And if you think about, um, we've talked before in the past on this show about some of the um, rules of uh, uh, of uh, conduct in, in battles. Engagement. engagement. Thank you. I knew I'd come up with that word. Engagement. See, uh, rules of engagement. And it seems that the men on the field in Vietnam uh, didn't have a whole lot of say. That's why the people in Washington, D.C. decided what was a friendly village and what was a unfriendly village. I know of a, a veteran uh, that's a friend of mine, a member of North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated, was in the artillery. He was in a village, and they could see two other villages. He was in an ba uh, uh, artillery base, and they had, could see two villages. And the friendly village, for some reason, they got mortared almost every night from the friendly village. But they couldn't shoot back because McNamara's uh, whiz kids in D.C. decided that was a friendly village. But they weren't in Vietnam. Uh, and that's kind of how the war was, uh, was fought with these guys coming along. They had all kinds of gadgets and so forth uh, that didn't work necessarily, which we'll get into a little bit. Um, one of the things that was said about McNamara... Next one. Huh? It was said that McNamara was the ultimate bean counter who knew it cost up everything but didn't know the value of nothing. And that's pretty harsh right there uh, statement. But uh, as I've as studied and read uh, about the, this project that I'm going to be talking to you about tonight, it, uh, uh, it seems to be very true. Uh, very educated man. Uh, I'm not certain he had a whole lot of common sense, but he was very educated. And I've even I have read in the past where uh, people in academia uh, think they're better uh, explaining the Vietnam War than the people were there because they were uh, removed from the day-to-day -day stuff. So they knew more about the Vietnam War than the people were there. I always thought that was uh, interesting. Um, yes, I will. Uh, continue looking at the camera, okay? Um, next one, next slide, please. Uh, during the Johnson administration, McNamara backed the escalation of U.S. involvement in, in, after the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, during which U.S. ships were allegedly attacked by the communist North Vietnamese. Now, whether the Johnson administration knew that the whole premise was a lie or not, I don't know, but... Um, Basically, the uh, Maddox and the other ship that were supposedly fired on, uh, and they were doing a lot of shooting themselves, but they weren't shooting it. Uh, the only thing we could figure out they were shooting at was a, flag, uh, a flight of Canadian geese or something like that. 
But that's what got us into the uh, war to start with. Considered to be one of the major, he was considered to be one of the major strategists behind the war. McNamara was reviled by many of the peace movement. Some were also critical of information he conveyed about the situation in Vietnam. He would meet with the press and he would say something, and it's not that you could, they would call him a liar. They just uh, felt he was very um, political in the way that uh, he could give uh, the answers that he wants. Uh, his thing was never give a direct answer to any question you get. Just tell them what it is that you want them to hear, which has become very popular now with um, uh, politicians and so forth. He did visit Vietnam several times during his tenure as Secretary of Defense. And during a later visit, he started going, hmm, maybe things aren't quite kosher. He reportedly began to develop reservations to whether the United States would be able to secure a victory over the communists. Didn't have any problems to keep sending men back in, but uh, uh, he was starting to have doubts. Next slide, please, sir. Operation uh, Rolling Thunder, which was a large bombing campaign, we dropped a lot of bombs, but they won't seem to be doing a whole lot of good. Uh, the whole idea was to slow the infiltration of the communists down uh, the, uh, in the north, coming south with down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and so forth. Uh, and according to the Pentagon Papers, which is a report that he uh, had put together before he resigned, uh, it was kind of secret, but it was printed uh, and brought out by a, um, a whistleblower. But according to Pentagon Papers, bombing sorties numbered 55,000 in 1965 and increased to 148,000 in 1966. Where in the world they get that many airplanes? Uh, those guys must have been flying around the clock. Uh, bom bomb tonnage rose from 33,000 pounds in or 33,000 in 1965 to 128,000 and the number of aircrafts lost from 171 to 318 with estimated cost totaling 1.2 billion in 1966. Now one of the problems we were having with the fact that we were more airplanes shot down was that we were having more airplanes uh, going there but at the same time the United States being the country who wanted to make sure they look after everybody decided they didn't want to make sure that we were not bombing civilians. So they would let the Swiss know that the Americans were going to bomb Hanoi or whatever uh, place uh, tomorrow at 5 o'clock so that they would tell the communist North Vietnamese that we were coming so that they could supposedly get the uh, civilians out of the way. But what they did was they kept the civilians there because they wanted as many civilians to get they were, uh, killed as possible for the, um, how we would look at the national press and so forth. So that didn't work out too good either. That was another idea that didn't come out. As the realization dawned that the bombing policy was not having desired effects, McNamara began to seek other options. And this is probably where some of the things went downhill. McNamara line. At the line between the two countries, the 19th parallel, if I remember correctly, because 38th was Korea, 19th parallel, uh, that was the DMZ, the military zone, uh, they basically cleared uh, an area on both sides of the line from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. And his idea was to create a barrier across the military line from along the DMZ from North and South Vietnam from the ocean all the way over to Laos and Cambodia. But in sort of creating an actual wall, what he wanted to be would be, because he thought it would be too costly in both materials and manpower, the barrier would have to be composed uh, components of high-tech listening devices and vibrating detectors and a complement of more traditional military weapons like landmines and barbed wire. The line designed to deter the, the uh, People's Army of the Republic of, the Republic of Vietnam or the a North Vietnamese Communist Army from crossing the DMZ also serves as a warning system to the Americans who could then directly direct artillery shells and missiles to the enemy across the line. The, met, the program met with many problems and after the siege of Quezon in 1968, the military commanders 
determined that the manpower necessary to lay the census and landmines were better used elsewhere. Along those lines, you get the idea that he might be coming up with a gimmick of the month or a gimmick of the week. Um, plus, if you uh, go back and look at your history, uh, they didn't come to across the DMZ that much. They came through the Ho Chi Minh trails, which was a, a, a series of many trails that came down through Laos and Cambodia to get into the South Vietnam. So I'm not certain that would work anyway. Uh, let me tell you some of the other devices he dropped and, 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 and did. What they did was they were having airplanes flying over uh, the jungles and they were dropping sensors. These sensors were supposed to detect urine. Now, the, the idea was that if you had a group of men coming down, uh, down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, whatever, these sensors would pick up their urine. But then they discovered that the census, these sensors could not tell if it was a man, a group of, of monkeys, or if it was a tiger. So that didn't do a whole lot of good. And they also dropped some sensors down the trails, and I'm not certain they did a whole lot of good. If it did, the, the people who were out in the field never got the information. Now, let's talk about what the whole show is about tonight. When the gimmicks weren't working, maybe we start putting more boots on the ground, which creates a problem. Where do you get these boots? So... McNamara came up with Project 100,000, sometimes called the Moron Corps, and was initiated in October of 1966 by Defense Secretary Robert Strange McNamara. Now, it was sold on the premises that this was going to take the mentally untrained men and bring them into the military and train them under the, under the idea of Johnson's War on Poverty, which is, uh, still hasn't worked. Uh, it was claimed that uh, time to give training and opportunity to the poor and uneducated. It was initiated to meet the escalating needs for additional manpower in Vietnam, was basically what it was there for. They were classified as the new standards men. To make them more visible, they were given special service numbers so that future commanders would know who they were because it was always important that we knew who they were. Now, I'm going to use uh, Merriam-Webster's uh, uh, dictionary on what a moron was. Uh, a very stupid or foolish person. Uh, full definition of moron, usually offensive, a person affected with mild mental retardation, or a very stupid person. Now, so when you get mad because I used the word moron, uh, don't come back and, and get me. I'm just using what they used. And give me from Now... The next one we're going to be talking about is, next slide. The new standards men had scored. These are people who had already been, tried to be inducted in the military, but failed the IQ test or, or other different tests and so forth. These men had scored in, uh, in the fourth category, the Armed Forces Qualification Test, that placed them in the top of the 30th percentile range. The new standard, uh, uh, standards men recruited in somewhere in the 320 to 354,000. Now, these were men who were deemed mentally uh, incapable of um, uh, being able to be trained. They were, may have been men that were um, had different reasons, uh, so forth. Uh, even though the entrance ex requirements were lower, supposedly, the normal training process, now this is important. Uh, I want you to remember this part. Even though the entrance requirements were lowered, supposedly the normal training process was with and equal to the performance standards of all recruits. You get the idea now where they're talking about bringing in women and more women into combat and how they have uh, not officially lowered the physical standards to, uh, to bring more women into combat, who most of us know that uh, they did. Well, this is what they're saying here. We're going to bring these people in who uh, maybe uh, are mentally not up to uh, normal requirements, but these people are special. Uh, we're going to bring them up and have them to, um, well, they're going to have to go through the same rigid, uh, rigid basic training standards we all do. Now, if you look at it this way, going back up, 
54 percent of them were volunteers and 46 46 percent were drafted and some of those drafted were drafted by judges in other words uh, the young man got in trouble and the judge gave him a choice would you like to go to jail would you like to go to the army or the marines or any of the other services and they and and they said well i think i'll go in the military rather than go to jail McNamara's 100,000 soldiers included those unable to speak English, low aptitude, physical impairments, along with those too tall, too short, overweight or, overweight or underweight. In other words, if you had a football knee, you could probably get, you probably would have been turned down. Uh, but one of the new uh, clarification program, you could uh, get going. Or as us in Vietnam used to say, if you could, if you could fog a mirror, they draft you. And that's a foggy mirror right there, because that means they would take you, they, if you were a body, uh, they'd take you. Uh, by drafting the project 100,000 men, the Pentagon would not have to draft an equal number of middle class or college boys with their deferments by, by dropping student deferments or calling up the reserves. So by bringing in these extra boots on the ground they needed, they could have done away with some of the deferments. A lot of people went to college and got the college education just so they wouldn't have to go into the military. And rather than make some of their voters uh, and, and contributors unhappy, uh, they come up with the uh, Project 100,000 or the uh, New Standards Men so they wouldn't have to direct uh, draft these uh, people and uh, didn't want to make the mamas mad and so forth. So that's the reason they come up with the uh, New Standards Men. Along with, but they needed something else to go with these, this new standard men. And along with this McNamara's new standard man was another special group of soldiers. This was a control, control group of what was considered acceptable soldiers. Each of the categories were identified in their 201 files or personal records by a large red uh, letter stamped on the first page of their files. Their assigned units had to prepare a month report on them and submit to the Department of Army. Now, what this meant was they had they want to compare uh, the insufficient soldiers to the ones who would pass anyway. So they had they started this control group. At that time of history, about 1.8 million men came came of military age each year. Before the Department of Defense lowered its entrance standards with the Project 100,000, the disqualification rate was about 600,000 men a year were disqualified. About half of these men failed the physical standards and the other half the mental and educational standards. It has been stated that with the lowered mental standards that it was still higher than the mental entrance standards of the Korean War. I don't know what that for is fact. It sounds kind of strange to me, but that's what uh, they said. Next slide, please. Now, between October of 1966 and December of 1971, when the um, New Standards Men, or Operation 100,000, uh, ended, approximately 354,000 men entered the military under the McNamara Project 100,000. Now, you would have thought when he was talking about Project 100,000 that he was talking about 100,000 men all together. That was his project. That was his projection per year was 100,000. 91% of those entered uh, on the lower uh, mental standards and 9% were lowered on uh, physical standards. That means 91% of the people who, were, who couldn't pass the mental exam uh, were taken in with under the new program. Uh, that's a lot of young men. All branches of service met their quotas and with the new standards men. It wasn't just the Army. Uh, 67%, uh, 67 to 70% of them went into the uh, military, Army, excuse me. Uh, the next biggest one was the Marines, and then after that was the Army and Navy. Now, I'll give you an idea how that was broken down. 1969 was the peak year of the new standards men, Project 100,000. 100, they inducted 103,000. Now, what kind of characteristics do they have? Um, I could almost be offended here by looking at these, but I understand what we're looking at. Uh, the home geographic area in the northeast 
The new standard men brought in was about 16%. The control group was 21%. The north central part of the United States, they brought in 22% of the new standards men uh, from that area. In the south, 48% of those brought in were from the south, with 28% of the control group. And in the west, 14% as opposed to 17% uh, from the control group. That alone, which looks like it would throw your statistics off because of the way the control group it was not equal to or um, parallel to uh, the new standard men. Now, going back and looking at the uh, South, uh, at the South, one reason it was 48% was you had a lot of young men uh, who, because of the farming communities and so forth, who could, had to drop out of school because their family needed the hands to put in, uh, put in tobacco or farm the fields. So you had a lot of those men in the South who uh, dropped out of school to help the family out on the farms and so forth, uh, not because they were necessarily um, uh, dumb. dumb or uh, did not meet the criteria of the original, uh, but they just were uh, men and uh, um, did not have the uh, high school education or whatever and so forth. So the average age was 20.1 as opposed to the control group was 20.2. The percentage of non-whites was 38%, a new standard, as opposed to 10% of the uh, control group. Again, you see how the, the control group was just kind of out of whack with what they were trying to do. High school graduates was 47% as opposed to 76% of the control group. Now, when I was growing up, and I'm not certain quite how they do it today, but I, when I was in like the fifth grade, I think we had guys in our class that could drive. I know they were shaving. Uh, because then they just kind of leave you in school for forever, just about, uh, until you got almost, uh, well, I, I, somewhere along the line, I guess they kicked you out in the 20s. But, uh, uh, we had at, at, in Wilson. Wilson, we had some guys that, uh, well, they were they were in school for a long time. Average school uh, grades completed was 10.7 as opposed to the 11.9 with the control group. I guess it was hard to get a control group that was been equal to the new standards group because they didn't qualify together. Uh, armed, armed Forces qualification test. Uh, ones that passed was be 13.6 as opposed to 56.8. And I, statistics are a strange thing, but uh, it kind of gives you an idea that this control group uh, was not exactly a control group. The men in Project 10,000 often could not read, so training manuals and or were turned into uh, made comic books, just so those guys who couldn't read could see the pictures. Some had to be taught to tie their shoes. Now, this kind of gives you the idea of the, 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 how low the United States government went to bring in uh, boots on the ground. They often failed in basic training or recycled over and over again until they finally reached some kind of standard or that somebody just decided, I'm tired of them going through basic training. Let's say they're trained and they're ready to go. Sometimes other soldiers took the test, a test, the mental and physical form. Many could not be taught more than trigger pulling. In other words, how to shoot a, uh, shoot a weapon. So the, all of them were shipped uh, to Vietnam, and most of them went straight to combat units. Now, when you go into a combat unit, there's a very uh, steep learning curve. That's why we basically you find the new guys were kind of shunned going into a combat situation because uh, the older guy, the guys had been there for a while, not necessarily the older, because uh, some of the guys that had been there could have been the 19 with a new guy could have been 20 or 25, but they stayed away from them because the idea was they didn't know how to stay alive, and if they're going to get killed, that was okay, but just don't get me killed with you. So there was a really fast learning curve, and some of these guys – since they had these problems, uh, didn't get the training or the background or the support they needed, and it just, well, it created a really interesting mess. Now, I'd like to share with you uh, some information 
from a, a gentleman uh, whose book I've been looking at. It's Hamilton Gregory's outstanding book, and it was called McNamara's Folly. And I'm going to quote some of the information out of it, just uh, verbatim out of it because I thought it was so good. Uh, when he went to an induction center, he was uh, asked, uh, they came in and asked uh, everybody at the induction center, everybody that was a college graduate, and he was, uh, said, yes, he was a college graduate. So the sergeant called him over to the side and says, uh, introduced him to uh, a soldier. And he says, I want you to take charge of, we're going to call him 4X. Go with him every step of the way. He explained that a young man could neither read nor write and would need help filling out uh, paperwork. Then he added, make sure he doesn't get lost. He's one of McNamara's morons. Now, how would you like to be anybody coming into a new environment, especially like being recruited into service, and you already got a stigma against you? Even if you're the smartest person in the world, if they treated you like they expected you to be a, a moron or whatever, uh, you'd be more inclined to act that way. And in basic, and this is what, he, uh, what Hamilton Gregory goes on to say, in basic training, he was helpless, talking about uh, Trooper 4X. Another training I had to make his bunk for him because he couldn't do it to Army specifications. I tied his boots for him every morning. He didn't know his left from his right, so he had trouble with basic commands like right face, left face. And he had trouble marching. Well, that would be a very good reason why he have a trouble marching. Uh, when the sergeants yelled at him, he became terrified and confused, which just basically like some of the rest of us did, but uh, he, for him it was worse. And the next part, I, I can just imagine how this was. On the rifle range, he was erratic and dangerous. The sergeants feared he would accidentally shoot himself or someone else. Finally put him on permanent KP. Now, I would have, well, I started to say I'd like to have been there when he was in grenade training. But then, uh, no, I wouldn't want to have been there when he was in grenade training because uh, I'm not certain he ever, that he, I never says whether he went to grenade training or not, but uh, probably with his other situations, they probably didn't. Now, President Johnson in, in secret uh, White House tapes, before Nixon got there, there was um, uh, secret White House tapes, and he referred to these uh, young men as second-class fellows. Uh, this McNamara uh, uh, Moran Corps or the Project 100,000 or whatever. Uh, so even, even they knew what they were doing at the time. Among the troops, these men were often known as McNamara's Morons or Moran Corps or McNamara's Boys. This is by the soldiers that train them and the soldiers they serve with. Because even though that report that 201 file that report that was sent to the uh, company clerks and so forth for their uh, weekly reports on how these people were doing, uh, the word got out to everybody uh, who these people were. So almost everybody knew who they were, uh, either by their action or by uh, knowing what was in their 201 file. Reacting to pressure from their superiors, some training officers and NCOs finagled to graduate men who were clearly unsuited for combat. Now, the drill sergeants and assistant drill sergeants got a pat on the back. Uh, that's a good old boy pat on the back if for all the people they got um, graduated out of basic training and how, how few they recycled. Now, recycle means that if you are going through basic training, you get sick, pneumonia, uh, get stabbed with a bayonet, or for whatever reason, or you just don't meet up to standards, they put you back in the start of, uh, with the next class of uh, recruits coming through basic training, so you go through basic training again, hopefully past the time that you were recycled the next time. And you might get past that recycle, but get a little farther into the basic training and get recycled again. And you could do it over again. Uh, I can't imagine uh, as bad as basic training was back then uh, having to do that. But uh, it, I know you aren't going to believe this, um, but as a result of some of this finagling were uh, some of these uh, less than um, average recruits suddenly started scoring high 
scores on mental, physical, and rifle tests. A guy come out with a expert marksmanship badge, or he come out the number one in his class uh, of, of graduates from basic training. And this was done by young sergeants sh with their heads shaved like a recruit, put on that trainee's shirt and went through uh, the final test with the name tag uh, for the, of that trainee. In other words, uh, Trooper 4X might have loaned his shirt to uh, a young sergeant that day, and um, he went to uh, wherever he went to, but he, uh, he come off the, uh, the final exam for the uh, graduation uh, for basic training and at the top of his class. Give me an idea how that went. And uh, cheating also took place at the recruiting station and induction centers. Recruiters and examiners fudged testing and screening so that the Army and Marines could induct men blatantly unfit for military duty. The recruiters had um, quotas, and uh, again, it goes back to when you went into the recruiter's office, if you could fog a mirror, there was a job for you in the military. Uh, so they were bringing them in. Now, McNamara, who was one of the most brilliant men in the world, according to everybody at that time, believed he could raise the intelligence of low-ability men through the use of videotapes. All you had to do was sit down and watch a few videotapes, and your IQ, goes up. your IQ goes up. A low aptitude student, McNamara said, he can use videotapes as an aid to his formal instructions and end up by becoming as proficient as a high aptitude student. This is from a man from Harvard. Now, where is video videotapes capable of producing these miracles? Well, we'll never know because very few men in Project 100,000 actually received video instructions and medial, remedial training. There was no time because we needed boots on the ground, and there was no funding for this remedial training or these videotapes. Gets right down to it. There won't no such thing. Okay? Now, when they got to Vietnam, and pretty much all of them did go to Vietnam, not all of them went out to combat, but a good part of them in. But a lot of times that you had some good career officers and sergeants, and they tried to protect these guys uh, for several reasons. One, because they were good guys and realized that uh, these guys needed protection. And, uh, the, and if you think about it as we go along, the life of your men out in the field depend on each other. Now, if you've got a guy that someone else took his rifle test for him, a guy who doesn't necessarily speak English, or a guy who couldn't tie his own shoes, or whatever, and really didn't have a whole lot of training, in, even in basic or AIT, and you come under fire, uh, he's not exactly going to look after your best interest. So... Uh, a lot of times they would keep these men out of combat and give them uh, relatively safe jobs away from the danger. It could be back in a base camp. It could be in supply. It could be a uh, KP kitchen, uh, a driver for somebody, uh, or whatever. But um, basically as much as they could keep them away from danger, even though there was no such places away from danger in Vietnam, because no matter where you were, whether you were in a big base camp or out on a fire, uh, fire base, uh, some of the Project 100,000 men were successful in the military. Not all of them uh, were failures. Uh, some, they may have scored poorly on the Armed Forces Qualification Test, but they had street smarts, a sound intelligence, or as I call it, I like to call it common sense, and they adapted well to training in the rigors of duty. They couldn't pass that. They had trouble with that uh, written test, but as far as life and common sense, uh, because they had been on the streets, they had uh, worked uh, and so forth their life, uh, they were able to adjust to it and became very successful and had long careers in the military. But for most, Project 100,000 program was a debacle. They were the last to get promoted. They were first to be sent to Vietnam. They saw more than their share of combat. They got more than their share of bad discharges. 
which goes back to a problem we're having now. Uh, these men who uh, were part of Project 100,000, the new standards men were drafted into military or allowed to join the military, got bad discharges, and today they're having physical problems due to their time in Vietnam, but they don't qualify for benefits. The reason they got bad discharges is because they may not be able to follow directions as somebody, that's, as some life or, uh, time officer had to be, or they were not as, um, for whatever reason, they got bad discharges, and today they're still paying the price for being cannon fodder and brought in because they don't qualify for the benefits. They don't qualify, for, they didn't qualify for the school. Uh, they don't qualify for uh, a home loan, VA home loan, because of this bad discharge. So they've been, uh, been paying the price for being uh, drafted in under this program from day one. Many of them who got out who were supposed to be uh, better going out in civilian life because they had some training, they were end up worse off than they were before they went in. Now this next picture here, uh, I kind of enjoyed this picture. This is a book that was left at the um, Vietnam Memorial Wall. Uh, McIntyre, to clear his conscience, in the end, before he died, wrote this book in retrospect, uh, The Tragedy and Lessons of uh, Vietnam by Robert S. McNamara. And this is where he talks about how he uh, changed his mind and realized all these mistakes. Now, if you look up top there, uh, this guy wrote down, wounded nine times. Wounded nine times. And I'm not going to read the rest of it uh, about his leadership, and so, about his leaders and so forth. But uh, if you noticed uh, here on the book, there's uh, holes or dots on the book, and they're numbered, one, two, three, four. He shot the book basically nine times, and he says, excellent book, worth nine bullets. And if you notice the picture there, it says uh, the real enemy and he circled Robert McNamara's picture. And at the bottom, he has written down, have a nice life. We fought for it. That's what to McNamara, he's saying that. And he was in Vietnam in 1970-71. Thanks for nothing. And his name, his uh, call sign was Headhunter16. So he, that was his radio call sign. Let's just kind of give you an idea how Vietnam vets felt about McNamara and this book in retrospect. Um, haven't read it, don't plan on reading it, and so forth. So what I'd like to recommend to you, if you'd like more information and some um, background, on, go in and read these books uh, that I've got here. Uh, the Bettis and Brightest by David Habelstein. Or as I quoted some uh, out of the uh, night, well, McNamara's Folly by Hamilton Gregory, who, who was uh, he was a Vietnam vet, served in '68 and '69. And I've got some other things I want to tell you about some of the soldiers I knew that uh, were in um, uh, Project 100,000. But uh, a wise person once told me that some people are educated beyond their intelligence. Could some of these people who were educated beyond, beyond their intelligence be the people who ran the war from about the Vietnam War in Washington? Wouldn't it be great if institutions of higher learning could teach common sense? As I mentioned before, Mr. McNamara enjoyed thoroughly the um, gimmicks he come up with. He thought the whole war could be fought with machines and, and so forth. Now, I want to read some excerpts from uh, the Vietnam Veterans of America uh, magazine that I get, since I'm a member of the Vietnam Veterans of America. And this is some of the people who uh, talked about the uh, McNamara's Morons or the uh, Project 100,000. Now, this is from a veteran. We had a young Project 100,000 men Excuse me, I'll have to look down and read it. 
uh, in my platoon during marches, and myself and the first squad leader ended up carrying him most of the time, literally. We were two trainees who were in good shape by the end of the cycle. I did not know, know what this fellow's individual deficiencies were, but I recognized his slow responses and near constant state of confusion. My little brother, who was born with Down syndrome, was much the same while he lived. Much worse, but the same. I had a few occasions where I needed to get, get between fellow platoon members and this man. They had no prior exposure to anyone exhibiting this behavior. These occasions I was alerted by others and was able to inter intercede. Although the platoon was aware of the program, many members couldn't seem to get their arms around it. In a nutshell, he graduated even though he could not march a quarter of a mile without falling out. He was not allowed to fail. This man was, who could not stand at attention without slouching forward was advanced. The only reason I could think of was so that McNamara did not fail. Another one. After a week or so, in, uh, so I was ordered to help this guy pass boot camp while I would be recycled myself. I couldn't believe this guy was there. How did he ever pass the mental test? He couldn't button his shirt, and the physical training was impossible for him. But he passed. I am proud to say I was one of those McNamara's morons. A learning disability was unheard of growing up as a child. I was tested for mental retardation at nine years old, failed third grade, and was illiterate. Ill 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 yeah, I'm having that problem. Illiterate in the seventh grade and tested for brain damage at 19. Drafted in April of 1967 against my dad's wishes, did basic at Fort Polk, couldn't perform physical challenges correctly, couldn't sight or, or sight, sight a rifle correctly, bolowed and was recycled. My second time through basic, I asked to see a chaplain, told him my life story. Afterwards, he asked me if I wanted to be sent home. No, I told him. I took a pledge when I was 10 years old that to my honor, I would do my best for my country and to God in my country, and stand by it. But I can't get recycled again. Okay, he said, I will guarantee you one thing. You won't be carrying a rifle. I was pushed through basic, all errors overlooked, and never graduated. Then I was sent to Fort Lee, uh, Fort Lee for quartermaster training, failed all my finals, then went to Vietnam for OJT as a supply shipping specialist. And he did, he did well in his time in service. These are just some of the men that have listed there. And I'm going to, uh, real quick, if I can tell you a story. Of a, I worked with a young man um, when I was in high school. He was out of high school. Uh, good, hard worker. Uh, he basically ran a, a, a restaurant. And uh, I didn't know until recently uh, that he was one of McNamara's 100,000. Good guy, uh, ran a restaurant, but it was, uh, was, uh, was slow, uh, mentally, mentally uh, slow. Uh, but uh, like I said, you could give him something to do, he could do it. And he uh, served in combat in Vietnam. I have another friend of mine who, uh, downtown Raleigh, Main Street of Raleigh is uh, Federal Street. On Federal Street, there is a... Uh, Furniture store has been there for a long time. Uh, this particular friend of mine, he and two, uh, he and two other guys, shoplifted a console TV from the showroom of the furniture store that faced Federal Street. What they did was that one of them held the door while the other two walked inside, picked up the console TV, and were walking down Federal Street, which is the main street in Raleigh. And uh, whether you believe it or not, they actually got caught. I uh, went to judge. Judge gave him a choice of go to jail or go to service. So he also became uh, part of McNamara's uh, 100,000. Served his time in combat, was wounded, came back out. This young man worked for a company 
for some, what, 20 years. The company was bought out by a larger company, and they wanted all the employees of the old company to be certified for the job they were doing. Now, this particular friend of mine had been doing this job for right at 20 years, but could not pass the certification test and was fired. This man was in his 60s, was fired from doing a job he was doing for 20 years because he couldn't pass the certification. Uh, you go back and look at all the things that go on about the Vietnam War, and you start realizing why maybe the war didn't come out like we thought it was. When you start taking men and putting their lives on the line that shouldn't be there. It's one of the many discouraging facts we have our government. Uh, if you go back and read about the Philadelphia Project uh, or about how men and women were uh, used as guinea pigs for uh, different drugs or how men and women were used without their knowledge in the nuclear test. Thank you for tuning in tonight's show. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Got several things working. I've got about four different guests who are going to be on the show. Uh, right now, tentatively, we're going to be talking about the military order of the Purple Hearts. Uh, that could be subject to change uh, depending on uh, the availability of my guests. But again, thank you for tuning in. Looking forward to seeing you in the next show. And welcome home to all you Vietnam veterans out there. Good night. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Current Affairs with Omnon Nissan, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.